Hi there, um, I'm Sarah Jane Gibbon. Hi, this is Jen here, Jen Harland. And we're going to give you a wee presentation today on the field work that we've been undertaking at scale in Rousey in Orkney. So the, the reason that we're digging at scale, first of all, for those of you that um, haven't seen the site or haven't been along, um, really it's the Peel of Islands, which we're all very much um, keen on. And as you know, um, looking at islands as microcosms and islands as laboratories. Um, and what we're doing in Rousey here is really trying to explore um, key themes to do with um, environmental um, change as well as um, historic change um, in an island context. Um, and of course, islands are nice places to dig in the summer, <laughs> even in Orkney. Um, and our island is Rousey and it's a particularly rich archaeological um, island, as you can see here. Um, so an awful lot of archaeology for us to investigate. And, and the star is where our site of scale is. And we'll tell you a little bit more about what scale is um, in the next slides. So along the coastal strip where, where we're excavating, um, you can see highlighted here, we're in a very rich prehistoric landscape um, of upstanding archaeology, including um, Midhow Chambered Cairn, and we've got... Midhow Barock on the top, two pictures from Midhow Barock. And also the site at Swandro, which Julie will be talking to you about um, in a separate um, presentation. And then we sit within that framework too. Um, the, the reasons that we're digging at scale um, is mainly to do with the chronology um, that is available to us at that site. So we're targeting the recent past um, because as you've seen, there's a lot of upstanding prehistoric archaeology that's already been investigated and being investigated. And that recent past has been much less investigated right throughout Orkney. And in fact, in terms of sort of late medieval settlements, there's very, very little known um, and the more recent past as well. So although we love the Vikings, um, um, the Norse, the Neolithic and the Iron Age, we're really interested to know what happens after that. What happens after that period? As the islands are becoming more Scottish um, and particularly at the time when we're seeing changes in climate, we've got events like the Black Death that have a huge impact on society. Can we pick these up archaeologically and what can we learn from that? And we're doing that at scale within the context of an estate landscape. So we know that there's a large medieval estate at scale and that estate oscillates through time um, in the historic period and we can feed that into the story that we're unpicking. And um, particular aspects of that are recent clearances. Um, it's one of the few islands in Orkney where people were removed from their homes and moved elsewhere. Um, what the impact of that is, both in terms of what survives archaeologically and on society more generally. And then looking at the land ownership changes more generally and at a more top level within that estate, estate structure. And we can do that um, for scale because we have this ability to combine both the archaeological evidence and the historical sources, which are particularly rich for this area, although not uncomplicated. Um, and the other element that we bring to this excavation that's really important to us is that community element, the public engagement aspect of it is embedded within the site and particularly so even for some of the directors within the team. So Ingrid is from the island of Rousey. I have um, family connections with the island of Rousey too. So we have a sort of personal investment in the island as well as that wider community public engagement elements where we bring in local volunteers to all that we're doing and um, we engage with the local school as well so it's very much part of what's happening in the island and allowing people in the island to have a role within that. So in terms of how we've approached the archaeology here because as you can see in in the slide hopefully you know we've got quite a large area to look at of upstanding buildings um field systems um scheduled monuments as well um so the way that we approached this was by doing a series of test pit, test pits in a in a grid pattern um and geophysics 
and then from that analysis targeted specific changes that appeared to be the most um, busy in terms of their geophysics and the ones that were going to tell us the most about the site. And we're not looking or certainly we didn't start off looking for buildings here. We were looking for middens to be able to tell us what was going on. So it was the buildings themselves weren't the focus, but inevitably the middens are next to and in part of the building structure. Um, but the, the idea was to use the environmental data to, to lead the, the excavations and the analysis at this site. And that, of course, as I've said, is also to be then combined with the historical sources. And this is the area that's kind of the part that I um, know more about, um, certainly than the environmental data. Um, we have lots of material for scale in comparison to other parts of Orkney. And whilst these resources are not as rich as what one would find in Iceland, for example, or mainland Scotland, um, we do have still enough material to be able to do some really interesting analysis. We have Orkney Inga Saga, of course, as our main sort of medieval text that's covering that 12th century elements. Um, but later on, we have series of uh, land rentals and legal documents that can help to unpick the estate and how it changes through time in really from the 14th century onwards. And we also have place names that can bridge that gap and tell us a, a longer story of settlement from the Norse period up to the present day as well. So we can get particular glimpses um, at, into certain aspects. We can tell what the medieval estate was by using the sagas and place names. And then we can see how that changes and develops over time. And then we have a really rich, 19th century historical series of documents to when the estate again is at its biggest. Do you want me? <laughs> uh, this is a, a, a aerial photo from the 2019 season, which was our last really big season. We've done quite a bit this summer, but 2019 was pretty big, um, and we had uh, pretty much all of um, all of our intensive area, the sort of the mounded up area. Um, explored in one way or another through a series of trenches and this this started out just as our little test pit grid and then we extended a number of these so what you can see on the left hand side by t4 that is our viking age um potentially a drinking hall we say sort of some sort of hall type structure um that could be the scali that is given the place name here um that's quite low in the sequence and what you've got in the the middle going so vertical is the um, the upstanding ruins of a, a 19th century craft. Um, Trench 19 um, was promising much, and, and as you'll see in a minute, we've opened that up quite a bit more, and, and it says that there's some very big structures in there um, and some very deep stratigraphy as well. So we got very excited by that. There's a lot of midden material in and around this, and then we have a few other trenches, uh, 22 and 20 there that you can see open. And in a minute, we will compare with what we uh, just finished this summer. Um, but next, we're going to give you just a quick look at what we did in 2021 when we just had a, a quick sort of two week um, season, but we did something a little different. Yeah, so in, in 2021, obviously, we were restricted in what we could do. Um, and it coincided with a small um, project that I had been working on to investigate the, the structure at the bottom of the picture. They are called the work. And this is a really interesting um, tower, medieval tower, that has been previously excavated. And yet we don't really know very much about it. And there's a discussion as to whether it's a 16th century building or whether it's a medieval building, um, sort of 12th, 13th century. Um, and to understand really whether it is a, was freestanding or whether there was always a building to the east of it. Um, so we got a, a small grant to investigate that. And what you can see in the corner is the geophysics results that we did um, in and around the site. And this is the first time that this had been done, um, revealing quite a busy um, landscape <laughs> um, around about the, the structure, which previously we didn't know of. So it's very exciting in terms of the possibility of there being other places to investigate. It's a scheduled site, so we were given permission to reopen um, two trenches that had previously been excavated by Storer Clouston in the early 1900s. And we were able to establish um, the 
sort of the credibility of his work, which was great because it was very accurate, his planning and his reporting. And um, in doing so, we were also able to establish that this tower was always part of a large building, like type whole house type structure, most comparable to the Bishop's Palace in, in Kirkwall in Orkney. So a really huge building, um, but completely devoid of any finds <laughs> whatsoever, which was incredibly frustrating and interesting. But um, as I say, we were really only covering very small trenches that had been previously excavated. But even so, there was hardly anything at all, which um, begs some questions as to what was going on here and whether it was ever actually finished or used, which is one of the interpretations. The only things we did find was a, a lot of red sandstone fragments, which for me was very exciting, but that's a talk perhaps for another day. <laughs> um, but it does suggest to us that there was a building of some importance in and around the work here or next door to the parish church, um, 13th century perhaps in origin um, and high status so it's building up a picture of what's going on in and around scale and for that it's been very interesting. So the other thing we did in the summer of 21 is uh, we continued a couple of the trenches uh, and just took a few more layers off we had a very small team and, and not there for that long. Um, we did open up trench five and it's packed full of mid and we just um, sampled a lot of it which was fantastic so we've been working on that juicy midden material um so this just shows some of the star finds we have um so we've been looking for interesting bits of imported pottery this is an example which probably would have come from the continent um someone will give us a tight date on that at some point soon we're going to have a pottery workshop where we're getting some experts in to tell us about this stuff but we know it's probably german um and it, it will be accurately dated at some point soon um we have other bits of continental red wares, uh, Scarborough wares as well. Um, that's probably a 12th, 13th century Scarborough ware. Um, so coming in from England. Um, this is a lovely little spindle whorl. It's made out of a, a whale, um, vertebral epiphysis, which is rather lovely. Um, and then this was our star find, a pair of um, reading glasses from the fairly recent past, uh, a prescription about sort of plus one, plus two, something like that. It still worked. So that was rather exciting. Um, what we did this past summer is we, we got a digger in because the area we, well, two of the areas we wanted to explore were of course under spoil heaps. So we got this lovely little digger in um, with a driver and he was incredibly professional and um, very delicately peeled back, moved the spoil heap and peeled back. And what a way to start a dig. Highly recommended. So very quickly, um, we got some large areas um, exposed, we extended trenches. We were doing field schools as well. We had lots of bodies this year to really help um, progress this quickly. So that's where we were the last time we had a big season in 2019. And here on the right hand side of the slide is where we got to. See, this isn't even quite at the end of the season. This was um, maybe three quarters of the way through our season. So we have really extended the, the main um, trench with our buildings. And we have a sequence of buildings here. Um, we've been able to figure out which is primary, which is secondary, and then probably in the top of it is a squared off uh, corn drying kiln, grain drying, um, set into the top with some very high up hearths in the sequence. Um, we uh, have a lot of material that will help us with dating. Now, what we also have is a, a sort of trench running along, it would have been an alleyway running along between two buildings. Cl close, I'm sure there's an Orkney term, which is not alleyway, um, but that was packed full of rubble. Um, there's not that much in it, but there are some exciting finds, which we'll show you in a minute, but it's also, it has no clay pipes in it, which definitely indicates, well, hopefully indicates it, it um, is kind of you know, pre the arrival of tobacco, uh, which will give us a bit of date, dating information. Um, we have sent a number of samples off in June for radiocarbon dating, but unfortunately do not have our results yet. Um, so, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, this was our star find of this this year. Um, and this is Sarah Jane and me finding this thing. And it is um, a massive, massive lump of carved red sandstone. Do you want to say a little Yeah, bit? Uh, very briefly. This is, um, at the moment, when you're looking at it, it's upside down because we were washing it. But it's, it's a capital um, from probably the 13th century we're looking at, I think, in terms of its style and... Again, just another example of high status, beautiful um, molded sandstone on 
this farm state and lots of questions about why that's there <laughs> but the fact that it's in what we're hoping is a quite an sort of early modern um period layer uh, is starting to change how we're perceiving that so the the previous thinking was that a lot of this red sandstone and molded material was brought over in antiquity but sort of 18th 19th century um to as folly material um but now that we're finding it at these earlier dates i think it's pr- Provi- providing more evidence that there may well have been a high status building on the island that this was incorporated into um, in in the 13th century and that's a very exciting possibility that we hope to continue to explore as we excavate further down through the sequence. So we do have quite a long way to go still in terms of descending. Um, <laughs> we have uh, it, it has astounded all of our expectations about the depth of the stratigraphy here. Um, we will get a date uh, from this context very soon and a number of other contexts that will certainly help us with our interpretation. But as we go back in time, we're probably looking at going up in status. So this little modest craft house ruins that stand very picturesquely on the top um, represent a very different type of living and a, a different type of, of status from what would have been there just a few hundred years previously. So um, in terms of our other finds this year, we do have um, a wonderful array of these sort of post-medieval finds. Uh, top left is a fishbone, because I had to include a picture of a fishbone, just a, a cod. Um, we found a, a huge cache of wine bottles this year, or, or spirits bottles, bottles that probably contained alcohol of some sort, uh, fairly near the surface. Um, and the second from the left picture is, is one of those, as is the picture top right. It shows a big, thick uh, bottle base. We found um, an inordinate number of those. Uh, the uh, image third from the left on the top is a whalebone, um, probably a handle from something, um, big chunky piece of whalebone. So it's a little hard to know what to do with it, but we'll look at it in more detail. Um, and then there'd be potential for biomolecular analysis, of course. Um, that bottom row, we have a lot of coarse pottery. So bottom left is coarse pottery. It would be at home on an Iron Age site and at home in a medieval site. Um, a lot of this came from that passageway where we found the carved red sandstone so there's questions about um, are they making this stuff locally? Um, we have some fairly complete vessels and hundreds of pieces of this stuff, so we will be able to do something with some typologies. We also have a lot of post-medieval glazed pottery you can see in the middle and glassware. At bottom right, it's two images of the same piece of pottery. It's a, it's an import, some sort of stoneware from the continent. Um, so someone will be able to tell us more about that at some point. A um, couple more slides to go here. Here's some of our other trenches um, where we were um exploring other areas other test pits that had shown that there was some juicy stuff in them um and the the main one to emphasize is the one on the right this is um, ingrid's trench where um there's a lot of dumped midden the, those reading glasses were in near the top of that and uh it looked like coming down finally on the natural and there was a a, a drain so we've sampled that um and there's a, there's a number of sort of juicy midden deposits associated with that trench um and we've had a, a team in from the Sea Change Project, which I'm part of, and we've been doing um, sampling for DNA. So we, we had the uh, some of the geneticists came to the site and we established some protocols for taking uh, DNA samples. So they've been trying to sort of talk us through how to take samples. And it, it was difficult to try to work out a protocol without them actually being on the site. So they came for a couple of days and we established some protocols that will actually work in the field. Um, and then we took a number of samples. So we'll be able to compare what Ingrid and I are finding in terms of the, the, the bone from the, the fish story and the mammal story and the birds, and then compare the bone uh, results with the actual um, DNA results. So it's experimental, but really fun. Um, so lots more to do. We'll certainly be going back next year, hopefully for another three weeks at least. Um, the field schools work really well. The students are really keen as well. So hopefully we'll get back and uh, and reopen this next year and get down. And uh, we'll know some dates as well by next year. So thank you. Yep. Thank you very much.